In section 1.5, we finally add enough expressive power to our formal language that we can start thinking about mathematical expressions um, or mathematical statements as they come up in, um, well, in mathematics. The, um, the if-then structure here is relating properties of things. So in this case, all of these statements are about um, uh, integer numbers, so whole numbers. And you can see in each case there are are two predicates involved. There are two statements and the uh, two predicates and the statement is, is talking about a relationship between them. So in the first question or first problem it says um, if the number ends in digit 2 then it's divisible by 2. That is um, stating or proposing a relationship between the property of ending in 2. So some numbers have that property, some numbers don't. And the property being divisible by 2. Some numbers have that property, some numbers don't. So statement number one is asserting a relationship between those uh, properties. And that's what each one of these does. It asserts a relationship between properties of numbers involving two predicates. And the predicates can involve more than one variable, as we see at the ones at the bottom. So that's what the structure is doing here. I'd like you to take a second and see if uh, which ones of these you believe are true and which ones you believe are false. And just pause the video while you make those decisions and then... Um, especially for the ones that are false, I want you to be able to tell me why you think that that's a false statement. Okay, so um, from the class discussion, we decided that those um, statements that are circled in red were false, and the statements circled in green were true. So there's three false statements and three true statements. The false statements are uh, fairly, we can give a fairly convincing reason because we can just give an example. So number two, for example, people in class mostly said um, false because of n equals 13. 13 ends in three, but 13 is not divisible by three. Uh, number four was a little more challenging, but we came up with the example n equals nine. Uh, so statement number four is false because of n equals nine, for example. Uh, nine is divisible by three, but nine squared plus nine is not divisible by four. And then um, in statement number five, we remember that the or in statement five is an inclusive or, and so that means it's okay for both things to be true. So something like n equals one and m equals three, for example, would be an example that shows that statement number five is false because one or three is odd is that's a true statement but one plus three is odd is a false statement so the most important thing here is that in all the cases where we decided this was odd um, we made that decision because in those cases we were able to find an example that made the first property true and the second property false so as we talk about um, as we talk about these kinds of statements, these if-then statements, it is good to give names to these different components. So uh, we will refer to the first. Oops, we'll refer to the first part of these things as the hypothesis. So I shouldn't say first part. The the if part, the part that goes with the if, is the hypothesis, and the part that goes with the then part is the conclusion. And I shouldn't say first and second because people can say things in English all different ways. So we really want to think of it as the, um, the if part and the then part. Um, so what we're seeing is that a statement is false. And if then statement like this is false, if the um, hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. So if we can find an example that makes the hypothesis true and the conclusion is false, then we would say these are not, um, these are not a stating a universal truth about the about these properties of, of integers. Um, overall, these if-then statements are called implications. So these are implicational statements, um, but you can just call them if-then statements if you'd like. So just pulling aside the false ones. These were the three examples that were false. So the slash statement um, show a predicate of the form uh, p of x implies q of x is false in the domain. We must um, 
find a value, um, let's call it D in the domain, so that P of D is true and Q of D is false. So this is what we decided, uh, we meant um, in these cases, oh, also the arrow here, right? So the arrow there is, a, is the notation that we're using for the, for the implication. So the arrow that you see there would be if P then Q, or we might just say in words, uh, P implies Q. All right, so lots of different uh, words we can use for these things. Um, when we have true statements is because we don't believe there is anything like that. Um, so tr uh, implication is true if there is no domain element. That makes this true and this false. So pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, that analysis of the if-then statement leads us to this table. So this table for the basic implication in propositional logic is saying that the only thing you can do, the only, re the only scenario in which the implication P implies Q is, is false, is the scenario where the hypothesis, the first part is true, and the conclusion is false. And, and these rows will bother you at some point, um, but uh, we'll look at every time we look at an example of this in context, then we'll see that that also makes sense. But the right way to think about it is to connect this to the first examples that we had and to acknowledge that the only scenario where you decided that statements were false were scenarios where the hypothesis was true and the conclusion was false. So this is the only uh, row two there is the only scenario where we would have a false implication. And so now that we can add that to our propositional logic toolbox, we can um, make truth tables using this symbol added to the mix. So for example, if I'm trying to form the truth table for not Q implies not P, then just like before, I would do the analysis that says I could do this as long as I have a table for not Q and a table for not P. And so I first construct those. I have the not Q table and the not P table. And those, of course, come from the P and Q by just reversing the, the logical symbol. Now, to do the analysis, um, I know that an implication is only false if the part on the left side of the arrow is true and the part on the right side of the arrow is false. So I'm looking for um, something in the not Q uh, row, or sorry, not Q column that's true, while at the same time the, va the, the entry in the not P column is false. And so if you look down, you can see that the only time that happens is here. That's the only time I have a T in the not Q column and an F in the not P column at the same time. And so that means I should have trues everywhere else. So that's the correct truth table for not Q implies not P, but also that's how we would add this into the mix. So we, we can have ands and ors and nots, and now this implication arrow, and we can unwind it the same way that we were doing before. We just have one more, um, one more symbol that we can add in. Notice that this is exactly the same as the original P implies Q table. It's on the previous slide. So this was the original, this was the original table. So this is logically equivalent to just the regular P implies Q proposition. And this is a significant uh, relationship that we'll take advantage of in the next unit when we're actually writing mathematical proofs. But I'll just uh, tell you the name of it right now because uh, Oh, and the names of this will come up later in the section. So these two things, these two implications, note that they're related <clears throat> by basically swapping the role of the hypothesis and conclusion, but also negating the two of them. So you're switching the order of the two parts, but you're negating them at the same time. If you do that, then you get something that's logically equivalent. And so this actually does come up 
and is helpful to know, we call this kind of pair of implications. We call them contrapositives of each other. So these two implications are contrapositive of each other, and the, the significant thing is they are logically equivalent. They mean exactly the same thing. So that'll be helpful to us later because it means that every time we see an if-then statement, there's another if-then statement that's the same, that says the same thing, and then we can sort of choose which one we think is easier for, uh, for our analysis or for our, um, for our explanation. But other than that, we can really now uh, expand on our, our truth tables to, um, to, use, to, to, uh, to apply to propositional logic statements that have uh, implications in them as well. So here's an example. Um, and, and the main thing here is that I'm going to follow the same process I did before. I'm trying to give a truth table for this, this complicated expression with lots of parentheses. And so I'm starting here by putting this way over on the right. Then I look at it and see that it is an implication where the hypothesis is, let me just erase that, where the hypothesis is this and the conclusion is this. So the structure of this is it's an implication with a complicated hypothesis and the conclusion is Q. So I already have a column for Q, so I don't need that, but I need a column for this complicated hypothesis. So I, so I create that, right? So that's this guy. And so now I repeat the analysis. This is now P, uh, the one that's here, is an and statement. It's P and something. And so, again, I could build that as long as I have a column for P and a column for this other thing. Well, I do have a column for P already. And so now I have to create a column for the other part of that and, which is this guy. So I am starting with that complicated thing and working my way back to the left, filling in what I need to know. And then once I have that, I can fill in my table left or right. So I'll go ahead and do that. The basic implication, so that third column from the left, that basic implication is only false in one case. It's only false in the case where the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. And so I can find that false case fairly quickly, and then I know the other ones, the other values are t's. The um, fourth column, so this column, um, is an AND statement, and so I know that an AND statement is true only if both parts are true. So I'm now looking in my P column and my P implies Q column for something where it's true in both cases. So I have trues in both cases here, and that is it. So only in the first scenario are both parts of that AND statement true, and then so I'll have my faults everywhere else. And then finally, uh, my last column is an implication, and so I have to be careful here because my hypothesis and conclusion are not, uh, my hy in, in, my, in my table, the hypothesis is not sitting right, right to the left of the conclusion. So I have to be careful here. Uh, I'm looking for scenarios where the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. So in scenario one, that does not happen. In scenario two, that does not happen. In scenario three, it doesn't happen. In scenario four, it doesn't happen. There is no scenario where the hypothesis part of this statement is true and the conclusion is false. So this statement is actually true in every scenario. And just FYI, there's a word for that. When you have a statement that's true in every possible scenario in propositional logic, this is called a tautology. And so that has some value um, when we think about um, sort of structure of proofs, and we'll come back to that later. Um, there are lots of tautologies in propositional logic, but um, any statement that is true in every imaginable scenario is a, is, a, is a tautology, meaning it's true no matter what, no matter what the statements P and Q mean, that statement is always true.